Uh, I'm Aidan, I'm one of the buildpacks.io team leads. Um, and I want to talk today about multi-architecture images. Um, surprisingly, or I don't know what, well, I don't really have any answers in this talk. But I would like to ask a lot of questions. Um, but firstly, as I said, I'm kind of going to introduce myself. And then I'd like to get a picture of your general knowledge of, of build packs. I've spoken to some people already just to see where things are. So as I mentioned, I'm Aiden. Um, I'm part of a team in Bloomberg that develops app or platforms on which our AI engineers at Bloomberg depend. And for us, build packs are a critical component uh, because they allow the Bloomberg AI engineers to achieve high velocity when they iterate on experiments. So I'm also a buildpacks.io team lead where I mostly help with documentation. So if you find any problems with the documentation, you can just shout at me. Um, in this talk, uh, I want to give a brief overview on the state of buildpacks in 2022. Uh, I want to present some motivation around why we might want multi-architecture images. And then I'm going to present kind of three high-level approaches to implementing multi-architecture images. As I said, it's important to note that we don't yet actually have a solution for this, um, but I'm trying to ask a lot of questions, um, and I'm not going to get down and deep into the code in this talk, so it should be a uh, high level. The key focus, though, is to accelerate the discussion around multi-architecture images and to encourage kind of uh, design questions around it. So I've spoken to some of you, but um, could I get maybe a hands up if you're kind of interested in build packs, but haven't yet done very much with them. Oh, wow, interesting, that, that's over half the talk. So certainly, I've got some stuff in this talk, certainly early on, that will hopefully uh, whet your appetite, and you can talk to me later about more details of the buildpacks.io booth. Um, hands up here if you've got a, a reasonable amount of experience with build packs. There's a couple of people here who have a reasonable amount of experience. Okay, great. I'm certainly going to be leaning on those of you uh, to contribute to the, this talk or the questions later on. And then I do recognize some faces. Stephen and Matt, you are the uh, seasoned Build Packs users. But are there any kind of seasoned Build Packs veterans out there in the audience? Oh, you're hiding in the back there. Fantastic. Matt, you just, Matt's given me kind of half. Yeah, he's only a K-Pack developer, but hey. So what are build packs is kind of um, an interesting question to ask in the first. Uh, th the way I like to talk about build packs is to say that they're a, a declarative way to translate application source code into a production image. Right, and I can give you hopefully a little demo of what I mean by this. I'm going to start with a fairly standard Hello World Python project. Yep, it's got an example.py. It's a fast API service. Um, what I'm going to do is, what am I going to do? I'm going to cd into the directory, and then I'm going to eventually run pack a CLI tool to build the output image. So again, I've started with a standard Python project. I've run the pack tool. Uh, the build pack process will introspect your project source code to determine, to determine what build packs contribute to the build. Um, and then during the build phase a bit later on, what it tends to do, or build packs kind of commonly do, is they provide an application runtime. In this case, it's going to be a Python runtime. They install application dependencies. In this case, it's going to be installing some pip dependencies that were in the requirements.txt file. And then it's going to apply some kind of configuration settings. Um, in this case, uh, I've used a Heroku-style proc file. So it's going to configure an entry point into my image using that, that proc file. If you don't know what the Heroku-style proc file is, you can talk to me later or ask a question about it. Um, so the sales pitch for build packs, that was a build, done, dusted. Um, but the sales pitch, you know, I don't need that demo slide, that was only for a fallback, is that we tend to produce, or we try and produce small and targeted production images. The builds are uh, replicatable, meaning that if you rebuild an image using the same application source with the same uh, dependencies, with the exact same dependencies, it leads for, to a byte-for-byte byte reproducible image. This is important in some regulated industries. Yeah. We've also got a nice uh, um, a property of, of build packs, the idea of being rebasable. The ability to switch out our run image with a small registry update. Um, if you want to talk about rebase or see it uh, in a bit more depth, have a visit of the build packs booth later. I'm not going to go into it in, in this talk, but it is a really neat operation. So, build packs. 
or more properly known as Cloud Native Build Packs, is a CNCF project. Go Team CNCF. Come on, people. Don't, don't, don't want to get it yet. Yay! <laughs> right. Cloud Native Build Packs are the third generation of an approach that was originally pioneered by kind of Heroku and people at Pivotal about a decade ago. So the ideas that are in this have been around for a long time. We do, though, have some really nice emerging features in 2022. Um, we have started, or we've actually released some um, experimental support to configure build and run images using a restricted Docker file syntax, which is quite neat. Uh, we've got some better support this quarter for user profiles on an image, and there's hopefully soon some easier tooling to start writing new build packs coming on stream. Uh, but in addition to the individual open source contributions, we have had in this quarter contributions from 13 different companies, which shows you that it is a, a live project with a lot of different contributors from multi, multiple vendors. So it is, you know, it, it's precisely what we'd like to see in a CNCF project being multi-vendor. Multi but what do we actually do at buildpacks.io? We actively maintain a number of specifications. As an end user, and most of you are here to think about it from an end user perspective, you should never really need to read these specifications. However, as a build packs author, you might from time to time have to dip into the build pack interface specification. And that kind of leads me to talk about the kind of people that we consider when we're developing these specifications. We keep in mind kind of three target user groups. Uh, first being, and most importantly, frankly, being the application developers. Um, application developers, we would say, use something we call a platform to build an image. You've already seen an example of a platform in the demo that I showed. Pack is an example of build packs platform. And application developers, unsurprisingly, just want to build an image. The second audience would be build packs authors. These people are open source contributors. Um, or maybe they're developing some company internal build packs. Uh, they tend to want to provide composable functionality to their application developers. Uh, for them, obviously, we provide the specifications, we provide the specification of the, of the platform, and we provide a uh, library, libcmb library in Go, which allows them to write build packs for their end users. Python and Rust libcmb-like bindings are available from, from other sources, and you can also write build packs in, in Bash or the technology that, of your choice. Finally, there's the, the use case for platform operators. These are the people who run the platforms to build the production images. Um, often, these uh, users want to enforce project-wide or corporate-wide policies. For example, they might want to say that you can build images on our platform, but we're going to enforce the policy that you can only ever use an internal mirror, mirror to resolve PIP dependencies or NPM dependencies or so on and so forth. So these are the kind of three user groups that we keep in mind when we're developing the specifications. And there are multiple implementations of these. There's not just one implementation of the build packs platform. Um, it seems appropriate to open, given that we're at KubeCon, with KPAC, uh, which I'll say a little bit more about in the next slide. But it's a Kubernetes controller, a Kubernetes operator for building images. Uh, it's currently maintained by VMware as an open source project. And I'm kind of questionly going to look at Matt McNew here and say that Cloud Foundry's Corify is derived from KPAC or based on KPAC. Kind of maybe nodding. He's kind of nodding. I got to take that as confirmation. Uh, other platforms are PAC. It's a command line tool provided by us at, at buildpacks.io on the CMB uh, project. Uh, and the PAC tool is used with a lot of other uh, projects. It's used quite often in GitHub Actions. It's used in Circle CI. It's used on a lot of places where build packs are used to build an image. Tecton's an open source CI CD platform. It's maintained by the Continuous Delivery Foundation. Spring Boot, interestingly, is also a, a build packs platform. They use the build pack steps underneath to output an OCI image for your Spring application. And then there's other platforms out there. Salesforce's um, Functions uses build packs to power their functions as a service platform. So there's a lot of implementations and a lot of different uses of these out there. And kind of newsflash, 
as of two weeks ago, there is an open proposal uh, to um, donate KPAC to the BillPacks.io CNCF project. So thank you very much, Matt, and all the other people at VMware. This is kind of cool. <laughs> um, we're really excited about this, uh, and we hope to be able to accept the proposal soon. You know, modulate all the work that has to be done. There's always work involved in these things. So um, I've said that there are many platforms for build packs. Um, and there are many platforms that use build packs to produce an output image. And there are many implementations themselves of build packs from multiple different vendors. Uh, Piketo is an open source and vendor neutral project that implements a set of build packs. Um, the Salesforce people have Heroku, build, uh, build packs for Heroku, which target the Heroku cloud or the Heroku platform. Google has a set of build packs that they've authored, which largely targets uh, a Google Cloud Run. And the VMware folk have a set of build packs, which are, some of them are derived from the Piketo build packs, uh, and they target VMware's Tanzu Cloud uh, platform. You can search for the build packs if you need a build pack to fill your needs at registry.buildpacks.io. But it's often a case that other companies also have internal build packs. For example, at Bloomberg, we primarily use the Parketo build packs, and then we extend them with custom build packs where we need to have some kind of custom functionality. So it might be interesting at this stage, particularly given that most of us in the room are new to build packs, to have a look at how a platform would go about building an image. There's plenty of seats down the front, people, if you want to just filter your way in, or, or on this side as well. So, interestingly, most end users will interact with a platform like PAC or KPAC, rather than uh, interacting with, with the build packs themselves. And yeah, you know, suppose we have that Hello World Python application, and we like how the Piketo build packs, for example, build Python applications. Well, we tell PAC to use and trust the Piketo builder, which is what you saw in the demo earlier. Uh, I had a PAC build example, and then I passed in a builder as a command line flag, which was the Piketo builder. And most builders contain four things. So the builder image is the build image on with our, which our Python application is built. And I've kind of used a gray box here to represent the builder on the right-hand side of the diagram. Um, the builder contains a collection of build packs. Um, the blue boxes here represent the collection of build packs. And it contains a reference to a run image. That's the green uh, box on the, on the diagram. And finally, builders tend to contain a copy of the buildpacks.io steps binary. Um, the buildpack steps I've kind of denoted with these kind of down arrows, these chevrons here that are colored purple and pink. We'll come to those in a minute. So it is worth looking at how pack and the buildpack steps interact to produce an image. And in the most straightforward case, and that's the only case I'm going to consider today is the most straightforward case, the platform spins up the builder image as a container. Uh, it mounts the application source code and does whatever other mounting it needs to do. And then it invokes the build pack steps in a particular order. And that order is the order that they're given here. We start with the analyze step. And the key role of the analyze step is pretty much just to bug out early if you don't have access to read and write to a registry. So for example, we don't want to perform a full build if we can't access the run image on your registry. Now, I've colored, as you can see, the detect step in pink, like I've colored the um, build step in pink, because these are generally of more interest to the um, build packs end users. In the detect phase, what happens is that each individual build pack provides its own detect binary. The detect build step runs the detect binaries of each build pack and finds out which build, pack can, which build packs contribute to the build. Now, we've seen this in the demo earlier. If I scroll back up, you can see that one of the first phases is the detect, and that in this, uh, th this builder contains a number of images that are build packs that I can't read. What does it say over there on the left-hand side? How many images or build packs does this builder contain? Six, nine, but only six of them contribute to the build. So the detect phase of all nine has run, but only six of them have recognized that this is a Python project and that we need to contribute builds, uh, part of the build for this Python project. The other three are Node.js build packs. And obviously, a Node.js build pack or related build pack don't contribute to a Python project. Fantastic. Cool. So it finds out what 
build packs contribute to the build, and then it outputs at the end of this stage a build plan and a build order for running the build packs in. There is a restore phase, which is next, um, and build packs support caching at, at many levels. Uh, I'm not going to go into the depths of this in this talk, particularly because of the, the um, variety of caching techniques that can be implemented in build packs. But the restore phase restores previously cached layers from volumes or, or from a registry. Next phase is the build phase. And this is a particularly interesting one to those uh, uh, end users. It takes the build order computed by the detect phase. And then each build pack, each individual build pack, contributes a build binary. Uh, and the build process executes the build binary of each build pack in the order given in the build order. So I think some details here are probably a little bit appropriate. You can see the build order that I've kind of put in the middle of this diagram. Um, and what we can see is that the, uh, it, each build pack is, is executed in the build order that's given. And the input to each individual build pack is a subset of the build plan that is useful to that particular build pack. We call this a build pack plan. It took me about three months to figure out that those were different things. So in the case, uh, in this particular case, there's kind of a Python distribution pill pack that contributes a C Python runtime to the, uh, as a layer to the image. There's a pip install build pack that's going to uh, con contribute at least a layer containing the application dependencies, probably some caching stuff as well, which I'm completely ignoring right now. And then there's the proc file build pack, which is, contributes a layer containing the entry point of the application. And in all cases, a full software bill of materials is provided for each layer. Finally, we've got the kind of export phase. Uh, and given all the layers produced by the build phase, the export phase produces an OCI image on top of the run image that was uh, part of the builder. Not all the layers are exported as part of the image. You know, I have ignored some details. There may be caching layers, there may be build-only layers. Those are not exported as part of the image, but they may be used for speeding up rebuilds in future. And the export phase does ensure that the cache layers are correctly cached. Now I get to talk about something really exciting, but I'm only going to touch on it. And the person you really need to bug about this is a person called Natalie at the, uh, the buildpacks.io booth. Now, I've given you one slide here on this, but this feature has taken many months to implement. So I'm really underselling her work here. But we released this month a new experimental feature. Uh, and the feature adds new build steps, which allows us to extend build and run images. Uh, the input to the extended phase is a very restricted Docker file. We certainly do not allow and don't intend to allow the full syntax and expressiveness of Docker files. But currently, the restriction only allows you to change the run image the way we've currently uh, implemented it. So we expect to increase the subset of Docker file syntax that we do support. Uh, and going forward, we will have a support mechanism for using native packages, meaning that if you're extending a, a Debian or Ubuntu image, you should be able to apt get install some packages. Or if you're extending a, a rail-based image, you'll be able to DNF install some RPM packages. Uh, and that brings me to thinking about things in terms of platforms. The pack platform itself is uh, ooh, timing. released on multiple platforms. The build steps, which I'll actually give a name to now, it's called Lifecycle. Uh, is released on multiple platforms, and the build and run images are available on multiple platforms. The build packs themselves are, you know, uh, primarily designed and they're implemented and tested uh, to run on AMD 64. I'm going to use the kind of Go names for these platforms. So AMD 64, what we might know as x86, 64, and other terminology. So the uh, Paketo, the Salesforce, the Google, the Tanzu, and our build packs that IO build packs all support Linux on AMD 64 and are all tested in, for that. It is unfortunately not the same case for Linux and ARM64. We find that still that pack lifecycle, the build and run images, uh, on our, are available on ARM64 for, from uh, many providers of build packs. But in general, sorry. But in general, uh, there's only partial support for Linux and ARM64 from pretty much any of the providers of build packs. And the question is, why would we be interested in this in the first place? Why are we interested in kind of AMD 64 and ARM 64? Well, as I said, you know, the platforms, ARM, K ARM PAC, and KPAC, are released on multiple architectures. However, in this talk, we're particularly interested in the output image. And many of us are interested in deploying output applications on both AMD 64 and ARM 64. 
This is largely because the cloud providers currently support both of these pl hardware platforms. So you can, you know, you can get a, a server from a, 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 a cloud provider that is an ARM64 server. Uh, if we have support for two platforms, our AMD64 and ARM64, then in future it should be easier to support other platforms, like a, some kind of MIPS64 platform. And it's also the case that developers at the moment have AMD64 or ARM64 laptops. This nice shiny new Mac M1 that I have is an ARM64 machine. And we'd like to make the development process uh, experience as neat and efficient for developers using non-AMD64 hardware. So I suppose I'm really scoping the questions around multi-architecture support at the moment to considering Linux and AMD64 and Linux and ARM64. So how do we go about supporting multi-architecture build packs? Is it simply the case that if we provide ARM64 build packs, then the problem is solved? Well, I kind of want to think about the problem from the perspective of each of our three user groups. Um, from the perspective of, the, of an application developer, an application developer, as we figured out before, just wants to build a production image. And it seems reasonable to provide some way for the application developers to choose an output image architecture. In this case, I've given them a dash dash platform Linux slash ARM64. And if we continue to use PAC as an example, you can see how this, this might, might um, be implemented, or this might be presented. And the output would be a collection of layers represented by a single uh, image manifest. It might be useful, or at least that's what I'm intending to do. I'm just gonna take a quick look at the OCI, our multi-architecture OCI manifests, just to convince ourselves that the user experience could be as straightforward as what I'm claiming here. So in this here, uh, if you've not seen this kind of stuff before, uh, I'm using Crane, which is a really nice tool, to view the manifest of the official BusyBox image. And I've filtered this in some ways because the, the actual output manifest that Crane shows is you know, hundreds of lines long. And what we can see here is an image index contain, which contains multiple manifests. And each manifest in the image index contains a platform property. And so from the perspective of our end user, they can run you know, Podman run BusyBox or Docker run BusyBox. And the container engine chooses the most appropriate image for their particular platform. So in general, we can produce multi-architecture images by providing manifest lists. And the manifest list on the left-hand side of this diagram is a list of manifests with the platform metadata. Um, and from the manifest list, you can find the image for your platform. So this is all part of the OCI specification for images that we all know and love, that we've all been running for probably many years at this stage. From the perspective of build pack authors, though, the question becomes a little bit more complex. And I'm aware that many, there aren't many of us in the room who are build packs authors or who want to be build packs authors. But build packs authors do need to support language specific technology stacks. Um, for example, build pack authors might want to provide a, a list or a set of build packs to support applications written in Go. Now, the Go ecosystem is designed to really smoothly support this multi architecture use case, which is great. However, it's not the case if you're providing a, a set of build packs that support Python or Node.js or Ruby or even Java or other technology stacks. For example, the, if you're providing Python build packs that provide a Python runtime, you need to have a Python runtime that's available for your AMD64 and your ARM64 platform. It's also the case that um, you know, build packs contribute, uh, that contribute dependencies may need to be aware of architectural differences. For example, many pip dependencies under the hood use GCC or something to compile native components for each platform. So our approach to, build, to supporting multi-architecture build packs also needs to be able to support build packs authors in maintaining their current high quality of code bases. So we need to support them to test on multiple architectures. And finally, look at the multi-architecture images from the perspective of a platform operator. A platform operator probably wants to pick and choose the architectures that they support for production builds. And the question arises, do all operators have access to the actual target hardware at build time? So, for example, or that is to say, would an operator want to build all images on AMD64 hardware that they have available, but actually allow deployment on both AMD64 and ARM64? 
So of the three classes of build pack users, platform operators, the, these people who run a build or a KPAC instance, for example, they need to uh, figure out how to support multi-architecture build packs to build multi-architecture images. Build pack authors uh, want a or probably want a mechanism to distinguish architectures, uh, and then actually test their build packs on multiple architectures. And finally, last but the most important class of user, application developers need only be aware probably of the architectures that their platform is intended or their application is intended to support. Um, I'm going to argue uh, that there are kind of three main approaches to considering generating multi-architectures images. There's a cross-compilation approach, an emulation approach, and a bare metal approach. And again, if you're new to build packs, maybe this kind of next four or five minutes of the talk is going to uh, not particularly uh, apply to you. But, you know, hopefully we learn something fun anyway. Ten minutes. Thank you very much. At the end of this entire process, whatever implementation we, technique we use, we want something that I'm going to diagram like this. I'm going to present it like this. We want a, an image manifest list, and we want that image manifest list to point at architecture-specific images. But in this instance, we want architecture-specific layers, the run image for AMD64 and the run image for AMD64. We want architecture-specific layers on top of those, but we also might want to be able to share some non-architecture-specific layers between the two images. So, um, what would happen, or how would we do, go about doing this if we used a cross-compilation uh, process? So in this diagram, I've drawn kind of a representation of the builder on top, which I introduced a bit earlier. Uh, I've drawn below that, in the bottom left-hand corner, a representation of how PAC, in this case, I've chosen one platform, uh, might execute the build steps, or some of the build steps. And I'm using that kind of stacked image layers diagram in the, in the bottom right-hand corner to represent the output image. And assuming that we have an AMD64 host machine, we might only need to provide a single AMD64 builder, which points to the run image for each, uh, which points to multiple run images, one for each um, output architecture. And the host build packs could cross-compile native dependencies for the target run architecture. So internally, a platform like PAC could run a single detect process, and then one build and export process per target architecture. In short, though, ah, click, yay. The cross-compilation approach is most simple for platform operators. It's probably most simple for the people that we probably don't need to simplify the process for. Um, the cross-compilation approach really does probably make life difficult for end users who may find that their native dependencies or their Python, or Python dependencies which have native dependencies simply don't cross-compile putting them in the situation where they have to talk to the upstream developers to make things easily cross-compile. So, you know, pros and cons, but I'm kind of leaning on the side of cons for this approach. What happened if we used kind of an emulation in place of uh, cross-compilation? Suppose, again, we're on the AMD64 machine, and the builder image then requires a run image per target architecture, a set of build packs for tar per target architecture. So the builder itself is now effectively composed of two different builders and a lifecycle binary per target architecture. Again, the platform could perform a single detect phase, uh, but it has to spin up virtual or emulated instances of the other, other steps for most uh, output target uh, platforms. Now, again, pros and cons of this approach. I'm keeping an eye on time. Um, so, well, we have to provide build packs or, uh, for each target platform. I would argue that we kind of aim platform parity for end users. And by that, I mean that if your dependency is supported on the target platform, uh, an ARM64 platform, it's highly likely to compile on an emulator for that target platform. Of course, the problem with emulation is that it incurs the emulator overhead. And we're restricted to the architectures that emulators, such as something like QEMU, support. Which gives us the kind of final uh, of the three approaches that I want to present today. That uh, there's a bare metal approach, where we assume that the platform operator, uh, operator has the hardware available for all target platforms. And like the case in the emulated approach, we need a builder to provide this effectively two different builders. So a single builder image that, that, that points to two different builders. 
And where the bare metal approach differs is that the platform needs to coordinate building between two different hosts. Now, again, what's clear in this case is that a, using multiple bare metal hosts will introduce new failure modes for platforms that we may, not, may or may not want to, um, to, 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 consider, or to, to put into a platform. That is to say, the platform now has to deal with the networking failures uh, when talking to multiple bare metal hosts. And this can impact both end users and platform operators. However, end users in this case would benefit from native compilation speeds on all platforms, which is certainly a, a bonus. So to summarize all this, oh, I need to look at this slide. Uh, what I've done so far is kind of outline the build packs process. So hopefully those of you who are, are new to build packs have learned a little bit about the build packs process. I've briefly, all too briefly, considered the new extender functionality, which has taken us months to develop and is really a cool piece of functionality. And I've presented three approaches to implementing multi-architecture image builds. That is cross compilation, hardware emulation, or the bare metal approach of having multiple hosts. Now, why I've done this is because I want to accelerate this discussion around multi-architecture images. As I said, I have no actual solutions in this talk. I really only have questions. So what are the next step? Well, platforms, I think, need to be able to create OCI manifest in indices or o OCI manifest indexes. This is independent of the approach that we take to generate the multi-architecture images. No matter which of these three approaches we, we, we choose, we still have to generate multi uh, OCI manifest indexes. And depending on the approach that we choose, platforms may need to consume multi-architecture builders. And nicely, after a conversation yesterday with Stephen, I think we're closer to this goal than I originally thought we were when I started writing this talk. So where does that leave us? Well, we want your opinions, people. There are links here to two GitHub issues that discuss different aspects of the multi of multi-architecture images. Please visit these, give us your opinion, um, give us some feedback. And if you get, uh, 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 I swear I can talk. If GitHub isn't your communication tool of choice, then find us at the buildpacks.io booth where we can see you face to face and talk with you. Finally, thank you very much for your time. I hope this is the start of a conversation and you know, if you can't visit the Bill Packs booth, please catch up with us async, either on the Bill Packs community on Slack, on the CNCF Slack, on Twitter, or you know, contribute some code on GitHub. Thank you very much for your time. My timekeeping friend is around somewhere. Do I have time to take a question or two? I don't know. Yes, we have time to take a question. Anyone got any questions? Hi, um, I'm going to give you a mic. Oh, just shout it out and I'll repeat it then. Uh, can you uh, take a second to talk about why you want to use build packs as opposed to just Docker files? Right. Uh, the question is why would I want to use something like build packs as opposed to Docker files? It's, it's a common question that we get. I'm going to give you the kind of one minute answer. Um, Docker files are great. Uh, really like the, what, what they do. What I have found, or what many of us have found, is that if we've got tens or hundreds of projects, uh, it then becomes difficult to maintain, or sometimes difficult to maintain Docker files, particularly as things change over time. So for example, Python 3.6 has recently fallen out of support, I think. Um, and what we'd like to do is upgrade all the applications that use Python 3.6 to at least Python 3.7. Now, in the Docker files approach, you write a bot or something that goes along, scans each Docker file, and, and uh, does the update in place, maybe submits a PR. In the build packs approach, particularly when I use a, a centralized uh, uh, build farm like KPack, what I basically say is that Python 3.7 now becomes the default builder. And effectively, because we've got SBOMs or we've got knowledge of what goes on in all of our images, we can say, let's rebuild all those images that used Python 3.6 to use Python 3.7 instead. So there's advantages to the build packs approach. They're faster in, in a lot of respects. It's easier from my perspective to centralize a lot of the policy that I need to roll out to the rest of my developers in my company. And it takes load, cognitive load off my developers. Some of my developers or some of the developers that we have are, are well, all of them are brilliant, but um, a lot of them are very specialized. And if I ask them to write a Docker file, of course they can because they're brilliant but it's really taking them away from their bread and butter, which might be 
some kind of a a AI machine learning stuff or financial analytics or that kind of stuff. And if I can take that cognitive load off them and put it onto a team of one or two people who can centralize all this and all this policy, well, we make a lot of problems go away. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Fantastic. And talk to me at the booth if you want some more in-depth answers. Uh, he's also the timekeeper, so if he gives you the mic, you definitely have time to answer the, ask the question. Thank you. I was wondering, how do you allow users to inject their own dependencies? You oh. made the Python example, let's say, one of the 100 projects has some C library that they install in their Docker container, but like, how does that work if they all have a build pack that's centrally managed? Yeah, no, that, that's a r really good question. I probably don't have time to get to the depths of it right now, but the way, three minutes, thanks. What, we end up, what you end up doing is writing your applications like you normally would. So in a Python case, because many of us are familiar with that, it's common to have a requirements.txt, or you'd put your dependencies in your pyproject.toml, file under the requires thing, that new thing that I haven't quite figured out yet. Right, a C library. Th that's a more difficult question. Generally speaking, for Python dependencies, if they compile their own C libraries, that works. If you want to install a C library, well, um, I, I think the best answer is, is uh, those would normally be installed, well, how, how's the best way to answer this question? I've done it in two or three different ways. One way is a hack which I'm not going to tell you about. Um, the other way is that you might install the C library on the run image to, to start with. And now with the new approach of, of allowing Docker files to switch the run image, you can switch between a, a lot of the run images depending on what's building on top of them. Uh, but previously what I would do, if there's a common C library that a lot of our application developers use, I would install that as part of uh, using RPM or, or apt-get on the run image that we ship to everything. Fantastic, thank you very much. One more question, please. Going to that example you had of running it natively and you've got multiple hosts and potentially running those builds in parallel, uh, is the merge step something that you have to like manually orchestrate together or is that something that potentially each build stream could do and potentially uh, have the manifest yeah. be created dynamically. No, that, that, that's it. I mean, I, I think that the question needs to be asked. The way I'm currently thinking about it is that, yes, they can run in parallel. Uh, each of the uh, output images might get pushed to a registry, and then at the end of all that, you might have some kind of process that kicks in and computes the manifest list for, um, for all the output images for, from the different target architectures. But it does lead to questions like, if I want to build for two architectures, and if one of the hosts fails, this is a, a failure mode that we previously hadn't had to consider in, in uh, BuildPack's platforms. So how do we handle that? How do we port that to the end user? Is that something that we want to support? Um, are platform operators comfortable with this approach? Um, I think you're asking the right questions, and uh, I, I don't have any answers at this stage. Brilliant. Um, thank you very much for being a wonderful audience. Um, and buildpacks.io booth downstairs around with all the, all the CNCF projects. Come down and find us and get some nice swag. <laughs>